Our next presenter is Connor Fitzgerald with ADHS Bureau of Infectious Disease and Services. And Connor has a presentation on lessons learned from the 2023 cyclospora outbreak investigation. And here's Connor's bio. Connor Fitzgerald received a Master of Public Health from the University of Arizona. Fitzgerald joined the Arizona Department of Health Services in 2020, where he has worked as a food and waterborne disease epidemiologist. Perfect. Uh, Connor, whenever you're ready, you can uh, share your screen and unmute yourself. All right, great. Thanks, Jacob. Appreciate that. Let me just share my screen here. And actually, I just wanted to say hi, and then I'm going to go uh, video off to help with um, with memory. Okay, if you could just confirm that um, you can hear me okay and see my slides. We can hear you and we can see your slides. Okay, excellent. Well, good good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Connor Fitzgerald. I'm going to be talking about um, a cyclospora outbreak that we had this year in Arizona. And um, this great photo in the background might look familiar to some of you. And that's because it's from the CDC website. So I just wanted to give credit where credit is due there. Okay, so um, we noticed a large increase in cyclospora cases, <clears throat> excuse me, in May of 2023. Um, we saw 10 cases that were, that were reported during April and May of this year compared with zero cases during that same time period um, from the previous four years, so 2019 to 2022. And so um, we don't see a lot of cyclospora in Arizona. Um, it is endemic in um, some countries that have tropical and subtropical climates, but it's pretty rare here. So I thought I would just mention a little bit about the biology in case we have folks on this, folks attending this conference that aren't familiar with the organism. So it's a unicellular protozoan parasite. It causes watery diarrhea and it's transmitted by contaminated food or water. The incubation period is around one week. So the full um, genus and species is Cyclospora chiatinensis, and infections only occur in humans, which is pretty interesting. So the parasite is spread by eating or drinking anything that has been contaminated with the feces of people who have cyclosporiasis. Because Cyclospora is a coccidian parasite, Infected people shed oocysts um, as opposed to cysts in their feces. And these oocysts have to mature or sporulate in the environment for days to weeks to become infective. Therefore, direct person to person transmission is unlikely. That's important. And according to the CDC, um, various types of imported fresh produce, such as raspberries, basil, snow peas, and mescaline lettuce, or spring mix, have been linked to past U.S. outbreaks of cyclosporiasis. And after consulting with um, FDA, our understanding is that it is unlikely for cyclospora to propagate within, an, within a facility, unlike some of the um, other organisms that we investigate. So that's a little bit on, on the biology. Um, and I have a little bit of a timeline here. I wasn't able to get everything in this timeline, but I, tr I tried to signpost some of the important events that happened during this investigation. So as I mentioned before, on May 25th, um, we saw those 10 cases and we reached out to our county partners and Maricopa County wrote back right away and said that they had also noticed the increase and that, that they observed a strong signal for one specific restaurant that we will refer to as restaurant A. Um, restaurant A is a, a fast food salad restaurant, um, and it has uh, locations in Maricopa, Pima, and Pinal County. And um, all the salads served at this restaurant contain romaine lettuce. Um, we also found out right around the same time that um, a Pinal County cyclosporiasis case um, said that they had a leftover Greek salad from restaurant A that they would hang on to for testing. 
And I was lucky because most people don't save uh, don't save salads for very long. All right, on June second, we were up to twenty two cases, and um, we started to interview cases with the NHGQ or the National Hypothesis Generating Questionnaire, and we observed a strong signal for romaine lettuce um, in those responses from the NHGQ. And so that um, lined up with the, the restaurant exposure that we were seeing. Okay, taking a closer look at um, some of the um, some of the exposures from that NHQQ questionnaire and comparing them from cases in our outbreak to um, responses in the Food Net Population Survey which is a survey that's administered in a variety of states to kind of get a feel for what the normal consumption is for certain foods. Um, so we were obviously interested in romaine with 88% of cases reporting romaine lettuce compared to um, around 50% in the food net population survey, as you can see there on the top. So. Um, we were looking closely at romaine, but also keeping an eye on pico de gallo. On June 5th, we were up to 28 cases. And at that point, we drafted a focus questionnaire to be administered uh, specifically to um, patients that reported eating at, at restaurant A. And um, Maricopa County EH collected records from restaurant A, and we shared those with the FDA. Um, Maricopa County EH was also able to obtain lettuce samples from the restaurant A processing facility for testing. All right, on June 9th, we were up to 41 cases. And at that point, FDA took over the traceback activities because it was pretty clear that um, at least the, the lettuce was tracing back out of, out of state. And um, we also released a Han at that time. For those of you not familiar with a Han, it stands for Health Alert Network. And it's really um, one of our primary methods of sharing cleared information about public health incidents with public health information officers, as well as federal, state, territorial, tribal, and local public health practitioners, clinicians, and public health laboratories. And I kind of paused on clinicians because um, this is a primary mechanism that we share important information with, with providers in the state of Arizona so that they know what to look for and um, what, to, what to include in their differential diagnosis and what testing to order. All right, back to the timeline. On um, June 29th, we were up to 59 cases. Um, and actually, we're going to hold at 59 cases for for the rest of the investigation. So we d we stopped receiving new cases, um, but the investigation continued. And the remain from restaurant A um, traced back to a single field in Salinas, California. So on June 30th, um, we received a preliminary positive test result for Cyclospora in the leftover salad. Um, that was tested at TGen, the Translational Genomics Research Institute. Um, so we were able to get them that leftover salad um, that I mentioned earlier from restaurant A, and they performed a, a PCR, a quantitative PCR test, and got this, um, this preliminary positive result, although the result was low level. Um, that was interesting to us because we also started to receive um, responses back from our focus questionnaire and a disproportionate number of, of patients were reporting the Greek salad, which was the leftover salad that was tested at TGen. Um, there, people were also reporting that salad in the focus questionnaire. So we sort of assumed, <clears throat> uh, well, the Greek salad must just be one of the most popular salads. And we reached out to, to restaurant A and um, found out that actually it was their fifth most popular salad, so not their most popular salad, and we took note of that. On July 13th, um, FDA collected romaine samples 
from a field in Salinas, California. However, <clears throat> they weren't able to collect samples from the same field where our um, let us trace back to because it wasn't in operation at the time. So they went to a different field, but that was being harvested by the same crow. Um, and uh, that wasn't ideal, but it was the best that uh, they could do at the time. Um, on July 19th, um, we, we received word that the confirmatory uh, sequencing results for the leftover Greek salad at TGen were indeterminate. That was a disappointment, and they thought that that could be due to the, the sort of low level that they um, that they saw in that preliminary test result. But we weren't able to do much with that um, that confirmatory result. Then on July twenty eighth, um, uh, all the romaine samples collected from the field in Salinas, the different field as I mentioned before also tested negative for cyclospora at an FDA lab. So we were kind of coming up uh, empty handed. So what do we actually know at this point in the investigation? Um, not as much as we hoped to know. Um, we knew that at this point, 90% of um, cases who had completed that NHGQ questionnaire reported consuming romaine lettuce. We knew that 78% of cases reported um, eating at restaurant A. These are cases that were interviewed. And then um, the people who completed the focus questionnaire for restaurant A, 78% reported the Greek salad. Um, so let's start with the romaine uh, lettuce exposure um, and the restaurant exposure. You can see that there were cases that ate romaine that did not eat at restaurant A. So it's tempting to assume that romaine from in and outside the restaurant was causing the outbreak. And while that could be the case, um, it helps to break down the romaine exposure amongst those that dined at restaurant A and those that denied restaurant A. Here you can see the romaine exposures of the two categories of cases compared to the expected US romaine consumption rates from the food net population survey again. And the last column shows probabilities or p-values using the binomial distribution model. Amongst the cases that reported dining at restaurant A, more cases reported consuming romaine than the background US consumption rate. And as you can see from the extremely small p-value, it is very unlikely that um, that result is due to chance. Amongst the cases that denied restaurant A, more cases also reported consuming romaine than the background US consumption rate. But with a p-value of 0 0.07, the difference could be due to chance. So the vehicle could have been romaine supplied to restaurant A, but overall US romaine consumption is not an ideal comparison for this type of analysis. It would be better to compare romaine consumption from cases that dined at restaurant A with controls or at least a background consumption rate from the actual restaurant, as opposed to the food net population survey. So that would be a subcluster analysis. And I will, I will return to that topic in a minute, but first I wanna get back to the Greek salad from the last, side, from the last slide. Um, so I mentioned before that most of the, um, we, we had a disproportionate number of people reporting that Greek salad um, in our focus questionnaire. And we also had that weak PCR result for the Greek salad at TGen. So most of the, you know, albeit sparse evidence that we had at that point in the investigation was implicating the Greek salad from restaurant A. Um, and even though it was not confirmed via sequencing, the Greek salad was the only positive result that we received from food or environmental samples. Um, so, I would already talked about the focus questionnaire and how those um, those numbers were higher than we would expect based on what we learned from the restaurant. And um, all salads sold by restaurant A also contain romaine. So it could have been romaine in, in the Greek salad, um, but if romaine were the vehicle, what explains the disproportionate consumption of Greek salad by cases in the, in the outbreak? 
So at that point, we realized that we really needed to conduct a subcluster analysis in order to try to rule out other ingredients in the Greek salad other than romaine. And at that point, we requested a complete product mix from restaurant A. Um, and a product mix is really just a complete list of um, all of the sales data from the restaurant. So we can see exactly what people were eating during the time period of interest. We received that product mix on October 14th and shortly thereafter completed a um, product mix analysis. So the table above shows the statistically significant um, or just you know results that have a p-value smaller than 0 0.05, but the significant results from a product mix analysis for restaurant A salads and wraps. Results from the restaurant cluster focus questionnaire were compared to restaurant sales data or the product mix in Arizona during the month of May. And again, p-values were calculated using the binomial distribution model. So this table is very similar to the tables I was showing before, but instead of comparing um, what cases were reporting in the focus questionnaire to background rates from the Food Net Population Survey, we're comparing um, case information to, um, to rates from the actual restaurant. And the ingredients in the table above cannot be ruled out as vehicles that cause the outbreak. Unfortunately, we weren't able to rule them out. Um, with the exception of avocado, all the ingredients in, in this table are found in the Greek salad wrap, the Greek salad or the Greek salad wrap, or the creamy Greek dressing. Um, we were unfortunately not able to identify a single vehicle using this analysis, but we thought it was important to exhaust all investigative avenues. All right, so just some, some summary information. Um, we ended up seeing cases in Navajo County, Yavapai County, Maricopa County, Pinal County, and Pima County. And the color coding on this map um, refers to the rate per 100,000 people. Um, I will also note that um, the cases in Yavapai and Navajo County reported traveling to other counties um, that had restaurant A locations. So in summary, um, again, we had 59 cases with no international travel that were reported in May and June of 2023. The onset date range was 429.23 to 6423, with a median of 521. 85% um, of cases had a completed interview, which was outstanding. 73% um, of cases had a sex at birth of female. And um, the age range was 21 to 80 years with a median of 48 years. 16% uh, of cases were hospitalized. And fortunately, we had zero deaths. And here's the, the final epi curve. Um, it's stratified by cases that denied um, restaurant A and cases that were part of the restaurant A subcluster. And then the cases that were lost to follow up are shown in dark gray. And that just means that we were unable to complete an interview with those cases. I will also note that um, we found out about the outbreak on May 25th. And as you can see from the epi curve, the outbreak was largely over at that point, unfortunately. So this is in part due to reporting delays, but I can also tell you that um, people waited a long time before uh, seeking medical attention in this outbreak. And that might have to do with um, cyclosporiasis, the type of illness that cyclosporiasis causes. Um, and it, I think it's gonna be one of the challenges that we're gonna face investigating cyclospora. All right, so um, lessons learned. Um, I'm gonna break the lessons learned down to challenges and successes. So some of the main challenges that we identified um, was genotyping. So you'll notice that I didn't mention uh, you know, genotyping or sequencing at all in this presentation. And that's because genotyping information from clinical specimens arrived late and was very difficult to interpret and not very useful. And that was a, a big challenge. Um, another challenge that we had was this uh, 
arcane agreement, the 2088 agreement, which is an agreement that the FDA has um, for sharing information with uh, state and local partners. And um, due to a lack of 2088 agreements in some counties, um, we had a hard time disseminating information from the FDA to all of our partners as uh, fluidly as we would have liked to have. And then um, the final challenge is uh, the lack of an epidemiologic study, the lack of a case control study was a major limitation in this investigation. And while we did perform a product mix analysis, it should have been done earlier in order to um, help us with our, our testing strategies, for example. It would have been great to collect other ingredients that were in the Greek salad from, um, from the facility um, before testing as opposed to just lettuce samples. Well, we did have some successes and I wanna end on those. Um, uh, communication and coordination between local, state and federal partners was overall very strong. And we heard that from our partners um, with the, probably the exception of that 2088 agreement that I mentioned um, and the problems that caused. But overall communication was good. Um, interviews, cases were interviewed in a timely and effective manner by local investigators. And I just can't give enough credit to the um, Maricopa County investigation team um, and other investigators that did a lot of hard work re-interviewing cases multiple times, et cetera. And record collection was also a big success. Um, we had a timely collection of records, um, specifically by, by Maricopa County EH. And um, uh, thanks to um, our partners on the food safety team, we had effective use of the Food Shield platform for sharing records between local, state, and federal entities. So just can't thank all of our partners enough. And I would like to thank all of you for listening to this presentation. And if there's time, I'd be um, happy to answer any questions that you might have. Fantastic. Thank you, Connor. Um, we do actually have two questions for you here uh, at the moment. I'm sure uh, more might come in but or could come in. Uh, the first question, is the Han something that we can sign up for? How do we do that? Oh, that is a question I might not know the answer to, actually. I know that um, we do have a, a predetermined network, but I imagine that um, people can be added. Um, if you send an email either to me or I, in that last slide, I stopped sharing, but um, our group email is food at azdhs.gov. If you send me an email, I'll get back to you with a, um, a better answer. Sounds good. And then the uh, second question that we have here is, why the over-apportionment of born females? Diet, preparation, manner of eating, physiology? Any of those? Yeah, th thanks for that question. Um, that's actually something I meant to answer when I was going over the summary statistics. You know, sometimes when I'm presenting, I get a little nervous and move too quickly. <laughs> but I meant to mention that um, we often do see a disproportionate number of women in outbreaks where um, the vehicle or suspected vehicle is leafy greens. So it's, it sounds like a terrible stereotype, um, but apparently women do eat more leafy greens and when um, the vehicle is leafy greens, we see more women. So I wouldn't go so far as to say that the vehicle was definitely leafy greens. I don't think we were able to identify an exact vehicle, but um, because of the, the you know, restaurant A signal um, it sort of makes sense in the context of this investigation. Absolutely. Um, I, it seems as though that uh, is the end of the questions. Uh, Connor, we just want to thank you for your presentation, and uh, we appreciate you being here. Okay, thank you all so much. Really appreciate it. Have a great day. You too.